Well, hello everyone. My name is Leilani Melendez. I am a former public and private school teacher, and I am a homeschool evaluator and advisor in the state of Florida for over 10 years, but I am most importantly a homeschool mom of four wonderful kids. My youngest daughter does have Down syndrome, and we are we're homeschooling her. Now, this video is very specific to a certain group of parents out there. However, if you only meet half the requirements, check out the timestamps down below in the description box. Skip around where you need to because the first thing that we are going to be covering is the homeschool laws in the state of Florida. And that pertains to every homeschooler in the state of Florida. Whether your child has a learning disability, any kind of disability or not, they are going to pertain to you. Next, I'm going to be talking about the empowerment scholarship for students with unique abilities. Now that is specific to Florida and that is specific to students with disabilities. The next thing I am going to talk about is curriculum and how we're going to teach our kids. Now that's going to pertain to all of you parents that have children with special needs. So make sure to check the timestamps for that if that's what you want to listen to. We're going to talk about curriculum. We're going to talk about how to find it, give you some suggestions some advice on how to find it. Next, we're going to talk about some co-ops, and then I plan on giving you guys some good encouragement that you can walk away feeling uplifted, knowing that you can do this, that you don't have to be afraid, give you that confidence, you know, all that stuff. So, once again, my name is Leilani Melendez, and this is my YouTube channel. I want to encourage you guys to subscribe because this is not only my journey, but I'm sharing with you all the things I'm learning, whether it's curriculum reviews, uh, therapies, things that I learned from other homeschool parents, interviews. It's just a mix match of just all, all this fun stuff. So let's get started with talking about the Florida laws. So whenever I wanna talk about the Florida laws, the homeschool laws, I really like to look at the source. So I went ahead and pulled some stuff from the government page, the statutes, and a home education program actually means the sequentially progressive instruction of a student directed by his or her parent in order to satisfy the attendance requirements of, and then there's, you know, a couple, 1002.41, etc. So the first thing I want to note is that is it is directed by his or her parent. And the law literally states that you are in charge of your child's education. The government can't tell you what to do. The school system, the district can't tell you specifically what you have to teach because you are in charge. Now, when they're talking about attendance, if you're coming from a different state, you might have, because different states have different legal requirements. In Florida, it is not about how many days you you teach your kids. And it's not about matching up with the calendar. What it's about is when you start schooling and when you finish schooling. So it actually has to do with all children, I'm gonna read right from it, all children who have attained the age of six years or who will have attained the age of six years by February 1st. And then a student who attains the age of 16 years during the school year is not subject to compulsory school attendance beyond the date upon which he or she attains that age. If the student files a formal declaration of intent to terminate school enrollment with the district school board. All right, so a lot of us that want our kids to go to college, we're gonna go past the age of 16, but there are some situations where once the child turns 16, we want to, they wanna terminate their homeschool education and you know maybe pursue a GED or whatever that family desires. It is not compulsory except between the ages of six and 16. That's all, that's, that's what it's talking about in, in the legal requirements. That's it in the state of Florida. Once again, not, don't worry about calendar dates. Don't worry about trying to get those 100 and whatever days that you need to do. In fact, when you actually meet with an evaluator, you don't have to prove any of that. You just need to show that your child has progressed. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later, but let's keep going with these Florida laws so you can understand them better. A couple things that I wanna point out that a lot of people hear these and they just get 
get relieved, right? So the parent is actually not required to hold a valid regular Florida teaching certificate. That's right. You don't have to have a teaching certificate to homeschool your kids. Yes. So <laughs> a home education program shall be excluded from meeting the requirements of a school day. And that's kind of what I was talking about before. Maybe you don't want to take President's Day off, or maybe you, you don't want to take, you know, a conference day off, right? Maybe instead you want to take the whole month of December off because Christmas is very important to you. These are the kind of things that you don't have to worry about when you're homeschooling. Home education students may participate in interscholastic extracurricular student activities, Bright Future Scholarship Program, dual enrollment programs, and eligible for admission to Florida college system institutions and state universities. So let's kind of break that a little bit down. When it says interscholastic extracurricular student activities, that pretty much means that if you decide that you want your child to go to a music class in the local high school, you are more than welcome to enroll them in that music class and that music class only as a homeschool parent. And they just attend that music class. When I was a teacher, I actually had a homeschool student in one of my classes and they only showed up to take that one class. So it is possible and it is completely legal. A lot of students will do sports activities. A lot of students will, like I said, music classes or take electives at their local high school. So that is completely fine. The next thing is Bright Future Scholarship Program. And yes, as a homeschooler, they can participate in that. Bright Future Scholarship Program, you can go to their website if you're interested in learning more about that information. The next one is Dual Enrollment Programs. And that's of course when you go to your local college or community college and you are going to enroll your child in there as a high schooler. It's called dual enrollment. They pass the class, they get college credit, and it's wonderful. It's a wonderful opportunity, and homeschoolers can do that. It's great. And for admission to Florida college system institutions and state universities. So I love that part of the law because as a homeschooler in the state of Florida, if you as the parent decide that you graduated your child and you make those transcripts out, the colleges actually have to accept them Be regardless. It's in the law. They have to accept them and your child can participate in those things. Now I'm not saying that they're not going to say, hold on, you know, maybe we're going to test because they're all going to test. They're all going to test your kids for placement exams, but your transcripts your transcripts, they have to accept them if they meet the, the requirements of what transcripts need, right? You know, colleges have certain requirements for admission into the college. And you wanna check with your local college if that's something that you wanna do, but they have to accept your transcripts. So keep that in mind. Next, I wanna talk about a school district may provide exceptional student education related services. As defined in State Board of Education rule to a home education program, students with a disability who, a student with a disability who is eligible for the services and who enrolls in a public school solely for the purpose of receiving those related services. So this is great information for us parents that want to take our child to get a certain therapy at the local school. Now, I'm going to share with you an experience that I went through. One of my children, I wanted them to get some speech, maybe get some speech therapy. And so I went down to the local school to first get them tested, right? And they can, if the school f sees fit, they can say, yes, we can provide these services for the student in this school. So I want to first, and I'll, I probably do this like several times during this talk, just give a shout out to Brenda Dickinson. She is our only lobbyist in the state of Florida, which I'm actually 
hopefully, which probably will happen, have her on my channel. We're going to interview her and talk to her because she is, she's just a wealth of information. For example, I'm going to talk about the Empowerment Scholarship later on. She is the reason we have the Empowerment Scholarship. She got our backs for real. So she has HEF, which is Homeschool Education Foundation. I'm going to leave a link in the description box below so you can check it out, read all the information, learn about her, and even get an opportunity to support what she's doing because she is working hard to keep our rights as homeschool families. So I'm giving her a shout out because she, when I was going through this whole process, she actually, I was able to communicate with her and she actually had me send some letters to some state representatives and it was just an experience because our children that need those extra services and they want to receive them from the schools, they need, the schools need to know that, 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 that that's a right. Now, I want to remind you this to the special needs families. Homeschoolers with disabilities do not require anything extra for the school district. Nothing. No, no IEPs. You don't need to even get those. My daughter, who has Down syndrome, does not have an IEP. She doesn't have a 504 plan. She doesn't need one because she is homeschooled. I am her. IEP. Okay, that didn't make any sense. But you see what I'm getting at? <laughs> all, all homeschoolers, regardless, have the same requirements in the state of Florida. Now, as a parent with a child that has a disability, there is some extra, extra help along the way. I'm going to talk about that when we get to the scholarship. A lot of us, if we're thinking about homeschooling, we want to know what the steps are to get our kids. It's so easy so easy in the state of Florida. According to the Florida Statutes 1002.41, the first thing that you have to do is notify your district superintendent of the county you live in within 30 days of writing. Name of children, birth dates, address with parent signature, nothing more. The superintendent must accept it and they may not ask for more information or assign a grade level unless they are enrolled in a school program. Okay, couple things there. You decide you want to take your kid out of school, you have 30 days to send in that letter of intent. The letter of intent, honestly, can be a piece of paper that you typed on and then you sign it and you scan it and you fax it. Every district is actually going to have a form because they, they like to do that for you. They just, they just want to give you a form, right? You can use their form, but you don't have to. You can go to the FPA website and use their form. But by law, all you need to have on there is the name, birth date, address, and parent signature. And it does say in writing so that parent signature needs to be your actual signature. The superintendent, if that's on there, on that, that piece of paper, they have to accept it. Even if it's not your district form that they put out on their website. You could use the FPA one, you could use the sheet of paper, the superintendent has to accept it, period. And they are not allowed to ask for more information, including the grade level. Okay, now this gets really interesting because if you decide going back to the Bright Future Scholarship, going back to getting special services in the schools, if you decide that you want to go back and do those things, you will need to give some kind of grade level. But if you're not going to do those things, you do not have to worry about grade levels. A lot of homeschoolers, we don't even want to mess with grade levels. So that's the first step. You want to get that letter in. Now, when you get that letter in, they're going to send you one back. Most districts are going to send you a letter back and they're going to say, you know, this child is going to be homeschooled and your one year anniversary, something along these lines, you will need to do a homeschool evaluation by whatever date. Keep that date in mind, put it on your calendar because you have to meet that requirement one year later. And that's the second thing you need to do as a Florida homeschooler. The parent shall maintain a portfolio of records and materials. The portfolio must consist of the following. A log of educational activities that is made contemporaneously with the instruction and that designates by title any reading materials used. 
Number two, samples of any writing, worksheets, workbooks, or creative materials used or developed by the student. You want to hold this portfolio for two years. After two years, you can, you can burn it if you want to. <laughs> Or keep it for memory. I know a lot of parents that like to keep it for memory's sake. So let's break this down just a little bit. Um, your portfolio, most people like to put it in a binder, but it is something that you design the way the way you want to. So binder's great. Binder's the easiest thing to do. And you want to put in there activities, educational activities, that shows that your child has improved. We're not looking at did they meet certain benchmarks, did they do certain things, standards, no. We just want to see that the child has made some improvement. And so this is where it gets nerve-wracking sometimes for children or children that have disabilities. And I can I can say firsthand, they don't always progress as fast as other kids. And and it, sometimes that progression is very minute. And you might even find that progression only happening in physical therapy or occupational therapy. And, and quite honest, those things right there, hands down, that is part of your homeschooling. That is part of their education. If they were going to a public school, that would be part of their daily activities for a lot of these kids. So I would get a log, like a piece of paper, and type out those things. They do therapies on this day, this many times. Here are the goals that they have. Here are the goals that they met. Type it all out on one sheet of paper. That's what I would do. Another thing that parents have, parents with disability, or parents that have students with disabilities run into is the non-verbal situation or the non-writing. They can't write, they can't use their hand. So you're not gonna have worksheets, you're not gonna have writing samples, you're not gonna have a lot of these things that it mentioned, samples of writing, worksheets, workbook, you're not gonna have a lot of these things that are mentioned. Okay, that doesn't mean you can't homeschool. There are ways around that. So let's say that, you know, they can't write. Well, but you can read to your child, right? So you can get books from the library, purchase books, and you can create a book list of all the books that you read. You can talk about all the field trips that you went on. Maybe you did some kind of activity or movies that you watched just all the things that you've done together that is quote unquote educational, which to be honest is pretty much, pretty much everything is justifiable as educational. If you decide to use the portfolio as your evaluation, there is an interview process that is supposed to happen. Obviously in the situation where a child is nonverbal, it's a matter of bringing the child alongside you during the evaluation and just letting their presence be known to the evaluator. They don't have to talk in order to pass the evaluation. Many of us evaluators understand the importance of all students being able to homeschool, even if they can't speak. We can work around this. I am gonna give you one example that I did of a parent whose child was nonverbal and could not write. Now, I don't know the diagnosis specifically of this child, but I do know that she had her binder, she had her list of extracurricular activities such as, you know, going to the aquarium, going to the zoo, you know, field trips, movies that they have watched, books that they read together. But what she also did is had a ha houseful, it was a houseful at the time because I was in her house, and a list listed in her binder, but she showed me all the little things that she did with her daughter. She would pull them out, it was a manipulative, we did this for this reason, it worked this way, here's another one that I got. So it was like a tour of her house, it was pretty much her portfolio evaluation as her daughter played in the middle of the floor. You know, it was great, it was a great experience. So that's just something, something to help you not feel so scared. Keeping the portfolio is actually something that every Florida parent has to do in the state of Florida. If you desire to terminate, within 30 days, you turn in a termination letter with the annual evaluation form. So that's really important because there are a lot of families that are like, you know what, we're, we're done homeschooling and we're gonna send them back to public school or private school. They wanna know if, it, if they still need to get their annual evaluation done at the end of the year. The answer is 
yes, legally. However, I know of many situations where they were able to do it without the annual evaluation. Same thing is true when your child is finishing high school, last year of high school. You're about to turn in that letter of termination because they, they're graduated. <laughs> graduated. Sorry, I like saying graduated. It's just fun. Graduated. So you send in the letter of termination with the annual evaluation. Now I did mention that the portfolio evaluation is just one of five, actually five different ways that you can have your child evaluated annually. So first I wanna point out in the laws is the parent shall provide for an annual educational evaluation in which is documented the student's demonstration of educational progress at a level commensurate with his or her ability. The parent shall select the method of evaluation. So, so let me talk about those five methods really quick. So we already talked about the portfolio evaluation, which quite honestly is the most popular and the easiest and the cheapest one to do. The second one is going to be a nationally normed test administered by a certified teacher. That could be a Cat5, Terra Nova, Nova, Iowa, Woodcock Johnson, or the Piot, the Peabody. And now I do administer the Peabody. I've done Cat5, Terra Nova, and Iowa. I don't do those currently, but you know, once my kids get older, I'll probably pick those up again. State, the third one is a state assessment test administered by a certified teacher. Now that's usually the test that is at your local school that they have yearly. So you would have to contact your school district to do, or actually your school to do that test. And the fourth one is evaluated by a psychologist or a school psychologist, which does happen. And that is another method that you can use. The fifth one is something that's agreed upon by the superintendent. And that's kind of like, I mean, I have, I've actually never heard of anyone using that one, but that's, that's situations where those other four don't work. So the superintendent has a right to make up you know, an annual evaluation for the student to meet their needs. Like I said, the annual portfolio evaluation tends to be the most popular and easiest. And I do homeschool evaluations, so if you need one, you can contact me. Stuff in the description box below. <laughs> Let's talk about you as a parent. When it comes to these state laws, I just want to point out, once again, you are actually in control you are in control of picking which evaluation method that you want. You are in control of the portfolio, what it's going to look like, what you're actually going to show the certified teacher. You are in control of who you actually have look at your child's work because you don't get assigned one, you get to pick it. And if you don't like them, like you, I have a checklist on my website that you can go through to interview evaluators to see if that's one that's going to meet your needs right? If you, if you, if you don't like them, don't use them. Find somebody else, <laughs> right? You get to choose. That's your choice. And I actually, this is one of the things that I do like to say when I'm advising them when it comes to, to finding an evaluator. So if you set up an appointment where you meet with the evaluator and you're finding that they're very, very, um, it, it's not going well, you have the right to stop the evaluation process and say, I don't think this is working out and um, thank you, bye. <laughs> I know. If the, or if the evaluator themselves is very in, in, unsure about whether or not they're comfortable signing the paperwork, and I'm going to tell you right now, that doesn't happen too often just because if you, the parent, are seeking out an evaluator, you probably got your stuff together. But if it does happen, you can dismiss them and find an evaluator. It's, it's an uncomfortable situation, but just knowing that you have that right, that you are in control, can help calm your nerves down, bring up your self-esteem, and know that you are doing the best that you could possibly do for your child. Your job is just to show them that your child is progressing however you want to. Right? So once again, the parent is in control. You pick the evaluator and you get to decide how your portfolio looks. And, and if you decide to do one of those tests, you get to decide how to do the test. It's up to you. You're just, you're in control. The law is on your side. It's awesome. It, there's a little, little work involved finding the evaluator, but hey, it's on your side. Now, 
I talked a little bit about what the portfolio looks like, the binder. A lot of people like doing binders with dividers. Order, uh, one of the things just from an evaluator perspective, just, you know, because it makes my life easier, <laughs> is having, if you do a binder and or if you're logging stuff, that you do put it in date order and subject order, just, just for clarity and sanity and organizational purposes. Another thing to remember is you do not have to place every single worksheet in your binder. We can tell if they did well, if they progressed, just by looking at, honestly, a few worksheets through the year. You know, and a lot of us evaluators know the curriculum really, really well. So if you pull out your binder and you're like, look, we did a Becca. And in my mind, I go, oh yeah, I know a Becca. Did they do it? Oh great, they did it and they did a great job. You did good. Like we know, we know what Abeka is teaching. We know what BJU is teaching. We know what all about spelling. We know these curriculums because we see them all the time and we use them too. So that's something to keep in mind. Also, like I said before, the nonverbal interview, just have them present. Photos are great. Pictures are great. Field trips, book list, all those things. Next, I want to talk about the Family Empowerment Scholarship for students with unique abilities. You can get this through Step Up for Student. Uh, currently, the system is going, it, it's getting some changes. So I'm not going to go into detail with the changes that are happening with the system. But it is through Step Up for Student. And it was originally called the Garner Scholarship, but it's not called that anymore. It's for ages 3 through grade 12 or age 22. And the child must have some kind of diagnosis. And on their website, they will list all the diagnosis. Um, it, it includes ADHD. It includes disabilities such as cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, autism, learning disabilities such as dyslexia. But they have to have a diagno diagnosis. And the funds are there. The funds roll over every single year, which is great. You can actually take those funds if you want to and put them towards college. There's a way to do that as well, but they will get anywhere between $7,000 to $10,000 a year. The funds roll over. This wonderful, wonderful scholarship, there are so many testimonies. I give the credit to Brenda Dickinson. Once again, our only lobbyist in the state of Florida that completely has her back. She's amazing. I'm putting the website down below. I'm telling you again because I really want to encourage you to check her out, support her, look at all the amazing things she's done. And she also has a lot of information about bills that are coming up. You know, the one that just went through that bill, she was the one that stepped up and said, no, 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 and helps them kind of fix it. She helped to fix it so that us homeschool parents still have our freedom. And she's amazing like that. So I can't begin to just, I just give her bells and whistles, all the things. <laughs> she's amazing. So let's talk about the curriculum. Let's talk about curriculum and how are we actually going to be teaching our children with disabilities. So first of all, the district is not going to help us. I've heard of many stories when a person decides to homeschool, they contact the district and say, hey, what curriculum do you recommend or what curriculum am I supposed to use? And the district just throws their hands up and says, you're on your own because they can't help you and they won't help you. Because once you make that choice to homeschool, you are officially parent directed. That's in the law. And that's kind of kind of good and bad. It's a little scary because homeschooling and looking for curriculum can be extremely overwhelming for any parent, whether you have a child with a disability or not. It's extremely overwhelming. Think about this. It is just like a business. It is a business. I mean, let's get real. It's a business. You've got all these different companies competing for your money and, and for your partnership, okay? They're going to come to you and tell you that their curriculum is the best curriculum for your child. But see, you as a parent, especially if you're new, don't really understand that that curriculum that they're trying to sell you may or may not be the best for your child. And then you start to worry, like, am I missing out, this and that. Look, just look at it as like a business. They're trying to sell you their curriculum. You need to go through and sort through out the curriculum and see what's a best fit for you and your child. But I will say this, because of the world that we live in, special needs curriculum is high demand right now. So all of these companies 
are putting out curriculum that is very specific to children that have learning disabilities, that have physical disabilities, it's out there. So that's good news because it's easier to find now good curriculum for kids with disabilities than it was 10 years ago. So when you're looking for curriculum, a couple things you want to keep in mind. You probably want curriculum that's pretty flexible. <laughs> And you will need to be flexible because if you start trying some curriculum and you try a math curriculum and it's just not working for your child, you can get rid of it and get a new one. That's the beauty of that scholarship in the state of Florida because if you get that scholarship and you spend $100 on a curriculum and it's not working, you don't feel guilty switching it out. So keep in mind, it's okay to be flexible. You also want to focus on their needs, not benchmarks, not state standards. I want you to focus on the needs that they need at that moment and you want to go at their pace. If you buy... I don't know, let's, let's, this one beautiful, I love this one, all right? Uh, learning language arts through literature, you buy that for your child, second grade level, and it takes you three years to do it, hey, they're still progressing, and it's totally okay. It took them three years at their pace. They improved. Good job, mom. <laughs> Uh, it's also okay to try different styles. Now you don't you don't want to just go all crazy on them and switch every week, but it's okay to switch up styles if something's not working for you. And when I say styles, I'm talking about you know hands-on Charlotte Mason style, classical education style, traditional style. Those are all styles. If you don't know what they are, uh, I actually do have a, a playlist. It's kind of old. But I'll go ahead and stick a link up here in the iCards. I'll try to update it in the future and give you, you know, the rundown. I do have it in my book, by the way, my book, Freedom to Learn, which I'll talk about at the end of this video. Uh, and I talk about all the different learning styles. But you want to know that it's okay to switch up the styles if you need to. Also, keep in mind that it may take time for you to find exactly what works for your child. And also know that it may switch up. So I think that that we all know that as parents with children that have disabilities, just parents, we just know that as parents, it, it's going to switch up and switch around and just be the flexible thing again, right? Also, reach out, don't be afraid to reach out to other moms in your similar situations. There are lots of groups that you can get involved with. Social media is a great platform to just begin that journey of reaching out to other moms. Online, um, YouTube, Instagram, social media, these are also great places to find ideas for curriculum. I know on my channel, I'll talk a lot about curriculum. I'll show you how I am homeschooling my daughter that has Down syndrome. So uh, conferences. So in Florida, we actually have the FPA, which did at one point have a specific special needs conference. It was great. You can actually go to their website and maybe download some of their older stuff. You can find also lots of other YouTubers and podcasts out there that talk specifically to parents that have children with disabilities. So check those out. Um, let me give you some examples of curriculum, curricula out there that are good. Uh, my favorite teaching textbooks, that's for math. It's really good. It's an online program. Nessie is specific for dyslexia, but it's also for learning delays as well. It's online. Brave Writer, also for dyslexia. Learning Language Arts Through Literature, that's one of my favorites. It's just, it's such a gentle, gentle approach. And like I said, you can get the first grade one or second grade one and take three years to do it. I love that one because they incorporate a lot of good literature to help your child learn. And it's a very gradual method. It's not going to go too heavy into stuff. And I actually know the lady who wrote it. She's amazing. So it's, it's just, it's an amazing program. All about reading, all about spelling. That uses the Orton-Gillingham method. Great for dyslexia. I'm actually using that one right now with my daughter with Down syndrome to just get that alphabet in her, right? We got to get her this, the alphabet. So happy to learn is specific to Down syndrome, but I have heard a lot of parents that have children with autism use that one. So that's a good one. Oak Meadow is specific to language arts. I don't know much about that one, but I hear many, many good reviews on it. Um, I know that one is a secular 
Uh, that's the only thing I know, is that it's good for special needs, it is secular. Time for Learning is another one that is online and it incorporates all the different, all the different subjects for that one. Splash Learn is another one that is online. It's math and reading, plus it has some worksheets that you can print out. A lot of people say that one is really good for autism and learning without tears. That one's great, especially for handwriting and then preschool, general preschool, everything preschool, learning your letters, phonics. That's a great one in general. We, we actually use a lot of their manipulatives for my daughter and the handwriting books. The great thing about the scholarship, once again, is you could purchase it over and over and over again. To, you know, I don't have to waste ink on my printer, which the scholarship actually pays for too. So it's a great one. <laughs> but let's talk about these co-ops because I wanted to touch on them. A lot of parents will ask me about, you know, whether or not it's, it's a smart thing to enroll your children into co-ops. Now, each co-op is going to look different. You're going to find some that offer paid classes. You're going to find co-ops that are parent-led classes where you actually, as the parent, can volunteer or have to volunteer. And so some co-ops will be more like play dates, meetups, field trips, and some co-ops will be kind of a mix of all of that put together. So when you're researching co-ops, you want to make sure you see what kind of co-op it is and what requirements are needed from you as the parent. Now there are some benefits to these co-ops. And one is, you know, of course, the friendship, the, the sense of community, especially if you get in a co-op with other parents that have similar situations as you. But some of these co-ops have a drop-off program where you can drop off your kid and you, the parent, can have a break. I know that's not ideal for all of us, but just know that some will have that. Um, exposure to other teachers and experiences. That's huge. Because I, I, as much as I love homeschooling and being my child's teacher, sometimes it's good to get another teacher in there. So that's one thing. And some of these co-ops will be free or low cost. Now as a drawback, since we're talking about money, some of these co-ops can be pricey, especially the ones where they hire a teacher to come in and teach your child. And that's, you know, the paid classes. Sometimes you may get into a co-op and you, you, you sign up, and then you realize it doesn't work for you and there is no reduction in price if you decide to drop off. So that that is a drawback for some of us. So you want to make sure you check to see if that is one of the policies. The getting ready process, getting out of the house, if that's something that's really difficult to do for you, that can definitely be a drawback. But if you can find a co-op online, yeah, that, that could work for you. Also, another drawback is not able to find the right co-op where you fit. So this is where it's important to visit the co-ops beforehand, ask lots of questions, pray, check out their financial obligations. Another thing important to note is that a lot of co-ops will be designated secular or religious. That's something you want to look into. Within religious, it's, sometimes it's denominational. Check that out. Look at the schedule, enrollment policies. Every co-op's different. It's not like a public school where everybody has the same, same basic everything. It, they all have different enrollment policies. So kind of keep that in mind when you're looking at co-ops. Now, as a parent, when you have a child with special needs, like I mentioned before, it is hard to step out and homeschool. So I wanted to give you a little bit of encouragement. And I feel like the best thing I can do right now is just read from my book <laughs> because I actually put a lot of thought process into what I'm about to read to you right now instead of trying to stumble through this with words and hope that it sounds encouraging in the moment. So I'm just going to kind of, I'm going to read to you from the book. Now the book is for any homeschool parent, but there is a section in here for us moms that have children with disabilities. So I wrote as a mom with with kids who struggle with learning disabilities and special needs, we face difficulties that many parents can't even imagine. Beyond the education and basic skills, there's the gossip, the behind the back whispers, the judgment, being left out, and things that make your life already difficult. Just makes it a little bit more painful. Understanding our God-given role is the first step. You are capable of succeeding as a parent. 
If you couldn't handle it, you would never have been given this job in the first place. You'll put in hours and sweat, you'll endure emotional and maybe even physical pain, you'll have to get back on your feet, repeat yourself a million times, and then do it all again. No one understands what you do in your home when the doors are closed. But then again, no one understands your child like you do. And your children need you. You are their voice, their advocate. You are their comfort when they realize that they are not like other children. You are their encouragement, their cheerleader. They know that no matter what is said or what happens, you have their back. Why wouldn't it be you who can educate them the best? No one can show them patience, even when you think you're running out, when you slip up, when you yell or walk away in frustration, you always come back ready to try again. They know you're there and that you'll always be there as long as you can. Sometimes it's hard to find the motivation you need to keep going because this is hard. You'll get burnt out. And this is where you need to take some time to find your motivation. Do you look forward to cooking with them? Do you get excited when they read a word or is it the time you spent cuddling on the couch watching a good movie? Find times that make you happy. Keep finding moments together and hang on to those. Remember them when you want to give up. Also remember to find free days. Days that you can just take off and be alone together. Find family time. Time with just you and your spouse and even time alone. Time to rejuvenate and collect yourself. Find a support group that you can laugh and joke with, but also support each other through tough times. Each season with a special needs child is different and calls for different hats and different tools. But you'll also find that you will always be their parent. Some seasons will be harder and will take more from you, but that doesn't always last. Some seasons will require you to stand back and observe. Either way, try to always find the good. Always try to find the joy in the little silly things in life, as long as they're appropriate. But find joy, find the positive in everything. So that's just a little bit of encouragement for you as you start, begin, continue this wonderful journey as homeschooling your child. So thank you so much. I, I put the book link down in the description box below. And until then, thank you guys so much for sticking it out. <laughs> thank you guys. And uh, we'll see each other soon. Bye.